Okie dokie. So we are officially live. So excited. Thank you all for being here in the group. I think it's going to be super, super fun uh, for all of us to kind of chat and be live together. So let's give everybody just a couple minutes to kind of get integrated and to jump on. I know that I am looking at myself, which is really, really weird in the screen next to me. So if you see me kind of look to the side, uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm monitoring the chat as well as your comments below, but this is 100% live. So, oh, there's Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. I'm so glad to be here. This is going to be so fun. Uh, I am thrilled to be here speaking with you. And of course, Kelly invited me here to the group because I am affectionately known, oh, got a heart, uh, as the foot whisperer here in Tampa, Florida, in the US, in America. Uh, and I just published a new book, which we'll talk about. But I see everybody kind of jumping on. We got some likes happening. Everybody's getting all good with the format. I'm so excited. This has gone really well, Kelly, so far. Uh, so let me jump into one of the questions. I have questions that Kelly actually fed to me based on questions that you all have asked in the past. She's such a good moderator. I love her. Uh, and then also, as you post questions in the chat on the live video, I'll be able to answer them in real time. And also, Kelly was kind enough to run a contest and get a, a winner of that contest where I will be doing a foot reading on the pictures that the contest winner has actually submitted. So that'll be super, super fun. Uh, yay, Kelly. Uh, love all this love. Thank you all so much for jumping on. Um, but let me kind of answer the first, first question, and this will kind of get the ball rolling. So Kelly asked me, how did you discover reflexology, Sam, and what inspired you to train as a reflexologist? So some of you, since this is a very international group and love reflexology, and Kelly specifically is based out of the UK, let me give you some down low on American laws. So Yay, Allison. Um, as far as laws go in the U.S. and specifically in Florida, every state kind of has its own laws that you need in order to practice. Some states don't have laws. Other states have really strict laws. Florida requires that you have a 500 hour reflexology or a massage therapy license minimum in order to train for reflexology and practice professionally, which may seem really crazy. I went to school for 750 hours, about eight months full time in order to sit for the massage exam in Florida, and then took a 200 hour reflexology certification on top of that. But what really got me started was I have a physical therapy background. I trained four years in physical and occupational therapy, and I interned at local clinics here. And I saw, especially in Florida, like we have a really, uh, we have a really shady insurance system. Like, as far as uh, American insurance goes, like there were some people that were doing some not so good stuff. Uh, and so I had some really bad experiences off the bat in physical therapy school. And I decided to go the manual therapy route. Also at the time, legal wise, they were just increasing the requirement from a doctor's degree to, uh, from a master's degree to a doctorate rather, which would have been another, you know, four plus years of school. So I was like, screw that. Uh, let's do reflexology and body work instead uh, but I didn't find body work until about a year and a half into my massage practice. And I took a one day kind of intro to reflexology course, not expecting it to work. Uh, but I had to do something different. I was kind of blowing out my hands. I was really aching in my shoulders. I was not doing good body work wise. And so I found reflexology as an alternative. And it turned out to be the thing that I would do for the next eight years of my practice. So it really kind of snuck on me uh, and was not an expected transition at all, but it is the thing that I have found to be the most directly effective uh, towards chronic pain and managing illness. So that's why I practice it today. Uh, and please, I'm seeing all the people that are watching and I'm seeing the likes and hearts. Please remember, if you have questions, you can always jump on. I have a set list of 10 questions, but I can kind of go back and forth so we can we can chat a little bit more. But in the meantime, let me let me move on to another question as you formulate yours. So Kelly also asked me, who did you study with and how did they inspire you? Uh, so I studied here in America with the International Institute of Reflexology. I know that some of you in this group have studied with them as well. So I studied underneath Dwight Byers and James Peterson. Uh, they are located here in St. Pete. I'm in Tampa, which is the city like right next to St. Pete. So they're relatively close to me. 
uh, and I trained with them. I took four weekend workshops with them, sat for their exam, did 100 documented sessions, and got their certification. Um, they inspired me, but also they kind of pushed me a little bit. Uh, they inspired me because they're kind of like the original, so I knew that I was learning from the best that America at least had to offer in terms of that. Uh, yeah, Kelly studied with IAR, awesome. We are uh, we're a brother and sister from a reflexology standpoint. Uh, but what, what happened was when I started to get really good at my practice and I started to get into the foot assessment realm and I started to actually look at the feet as a true reflection of the person, internal as well as physical. So kind of working with organs, glands, joint structures, but also seeing how the thoughts and opinions and feelings and emotions and somebody's sense of career and purpose and their relationships and their sense of security, those internal feelings were mapped on the feet as well. They unfortunately fell a little bit short. They didn't even really explain how besides tenderness, we could really decode the markers or kind of messages that the feet had to say. So they inspired me because they were awesome, but then they also kind of cut me off at a certain point and I was on my own in the world trying to figure out this elusive thing as far as foot reading goes. Because I know as reflexologists, like we all hear about those reflexologists that are mysteriously magical and they can like look at the feet and feel the reflexes and tell, you know, whether or not somebody had a hysterectomy or something. But I never met those reflexologists. Like as far as I was concerned, like they were a myth. Uh, and so I really had to seek out this foot reading on my own. And that was what really kind of reverse inspired me, kind of discouraged but encouraged me to, to figure out this foot reading thing from the, uh, from the get-go. Uh, then Kelly asks, as a reflexologist, can you name one of the most rewarding treatments you've experienced? And this is before I sought the formal certification, uh, Hey, Anne-Marie, perfect, I'll answer your question in just a second. Uh, when, before I actually jumped into formal certification, I wanted to see if this thing actually worked, this reflexology thing. Like, did it actually work the way that people said it did? And it turns out that it did, but I think the most powerful treatment was one of those early treatments. I had a client that I was doing massage largely at the time, and I had a client that had to cancel multiple appointments because of irritable bowel issues. And they were formally diagnosed and they were really pro they were a very real problem. And so one day they didn't necessarily cancel, but they came in and they were in the in the middle of like a really bad fit. And so they had severe digestive kind of distension. They had a lot of gas floating pain. And it was very uncomfortable for them to actually physically be present, let alone lie face down on a table, kind of pressing on the gut for a massage session. So I said, you know what, hon, why don't we just do reflexology today. Let's let's give it a shot and see if this thing actually works. Because I had seen the client regularly for a long time, so we had a rapport. And we did the reflexology, and I got a call from her the next day saying, I don't know what you did, but we need to do that twice a week for the next month at least, because my symptoms are gone. And that was really my first experience, like just saying it, I get chills. Uh, it's It was really the thing that hammered home to me that yes, the feet do contain an entire interconnected map of the body. And you know, the foot reading thing came way down the line from that. So I think that was my first like legit experience of, oh my God, this thing is real. Let me take a drink real fast. So Emery said, do you do a separate course on foot reading? That is actually coming. Uh, I published the book, actually, for those of you that haven't seen the book, Foot Reading uh, Reflexology Primer on Foot Assessment. That's the book that I just wrote. Literally launched end of September, beginning of October. So super new. Uh, and then I'm currently in the throes of developing that online course. In fact, I just filmed a module before this, before this interview. Uh, and I will be launching that course January. That will be the time frame for the course. So that online course is coming. I have a lot, because the book has gotten so many amazing reviews uh, from people all across the world. I mean, the international base of reflexology really surprised me. I didn't expect it to be so worldwide, but also being in the US and being in Florida, I didn't know how big it was outside of the US. Like hearing that we have the International Institute of Reflexology here, like I thought there would have been more of a hub in America, but then as I'm like writing the foot reading book and as I'm interacting with some of you online, some of you are part of my group, on Facebook as well, the foot reading and reflexology online community. Like I'm getting hits from people over in the UK, Southern Ireland, Australia, Africa, Brazil, like all of these people that I never expected 
to connect with because of the book. And because of that, I'm really having to expand uh, my core space and do a lot more stuff online. Uh, as well as, interesting thing, like as a reflexologist who has now become known as a foot reader, what's become really interesting to me is that, you know, as a body worker, a hands-on, you think, you know, if you're not hands-on, it's not a session, right? It's not like a treatment. So when I started to get into the foot reading space and when I started to actually do more assessment and coaching based on what I found, I started doing Skype sessions. I started seeing people remotely and people would literally, I know this sounds really weird, but they would stick their feet up to the camera and I would jot down notes and then we'd have like hour long discussions over the internet based on what I found in their feet. And that was, blew my mind. So it really showed me, especially from a technology standpoint, that one, there's value outside of kind of my own backyard for this modality, but two, that the technology right now is amazing. Like I wouldn't have thought when I started, you know, 10 years ago almost that I would be doing a Facebook live interview on foot reading in an online reflexology group. Like that's, that's insane, but it's happening. So this foot reading aspect and the non hands-on aspect of the work is really starting to become more prevalent in our field. I think, uh, Kat Ann says, can you share any positive experiences with working on children with autism? Uh, so autism is something that is actually near and dear to my heart. Some of you don't know this, but I'm actually, on, not necessarily on the spectrum, but I have been classified as hypersensitive. Uh, so sounds, lights, emotional influences, things like intuitive and empathic feelings actually plague me uh, in large doses, which is why I love doing online interviews like this and uh, why I don't necessarily go out to clubs and party all night is because I can't take it in my nervous system. So I resonate very, very highly, especially with my clients here at the Institute. I have children on the autistic spectrum that I see and that resonate with me. Um, and so I see them, but the thing about autistic children is that it's hit or miss. It's either they love it or they don't. Either they're sticking your feet, their feet in your face and they're wanting more because their body is saying yes to it, or for some reason they just, they don't want to be touched. Uh, and you have to be able to respect that. So what I'll do, and sometimes it's a physical thing, like the nerves are just rejecting the touch, the alternating pressure, but then sometimes it's a personal thing as well. So if they reject me personally as a body worker because they don't know me and they're hypersensitive to kind of my vibe and experience, what we'll do is I will coach the parent on how to do reflexology at home for the child. And that way the, they don't have to bring the child to me. They can do it on their own schedule at their own pace. You know, they can watch the videos that I put on YouTube for that. They don't even need to schedule an appointment with me. They just need to taste the work and kind of work with their child to really find benefit. And that's no, not just with the autistic spectrum, that's any child. You know, some kids just don't like body work. They don't like to be touched and that's okay. But then especially if any child has like a real health problem, body work must be explored, even if it's not reflexology, I think. But I think that if the body is craving touch, reflexology is a fantastic modality just to play with. They don't even need to know what they're doing. And I tell my clients that a lot. You don't need to know what you're doing to make a difference with reflexology. Yes, there are intricacies of technique. And yes, don't even try to get into the complexities of foot assessment if you don't have a, an anatomy background. But just to rub the feet and stimulate the reflexes and work with a child, I mean, that's easy. Okay. Do, do, do. And then we have Amy, Amy Debara. Hope I'm saying that right. Where is good to work on for epilepsy? Would it be the big toe? Thanks. I had to work up a routine with my son and it took a while. Love it, Kat Ann. So let's talk about epilepsy. And it, I'm gonna open up Pandora's box. So Kelly doesn't know that I'm gonna do this. We're gonna talk a little bit about my own reflexology theory for two seconds. Um, I have, I was trained in International Institute's kind of press button fix issue modality. And I have found that that is not the way that reflexology truly works. So what I mean by that is that as reflexologists, if you pick up a reflexology book, there's some misleading theory in terms of this idea that if somebody has a gallbladder issue, you press the gallbladder reflex and the gallbladder goes and starts squirting out like gallbladder stuff. That's, that's not how it works. Same thing with the hormone glands. It's not like you press the pituitary and the pituitary pineal goes and starts squirting out hormones. 
That's not how reflexology works. Instead, when somebody is dealing with a systemic condition like a nervous system dysfunction like epilepsy, it's always so important to work the entire foot and to not just be focused on what would be termed the general rule or the areas of emphasis that are associated with that pathology. Because you never know where the tension is being held and you never know what is causing that issue to truly manifest, which is what I talk about as far as the importance of foot assessment and assessing the reflexes, not just blindly stimulating based on what somebody else says, but instead really palpating using your sense of visual, textural, kind of sensory organness with you as a reflexologist to feel where the body needs to be touched and to co then kind of break down what reflexes need to be worked on. So for epilepsy, you know, we would think to go straight to the big toe or straight to kind of like the crown of the toes, that, that top of the big toe, which would represent the brain, kind of the central command of the nervous system, yeah. But what if the epilepsy is triggered by diet? What if the epilepsy is triggered by an immune deficiency? What if the epilepsy is simply a fluid buildup in the tissues uh, that reaches a certain point? Um, everybody, their pathology is different, even though the brand of their dysfunction is the same. So two people with IBS are going to have very different symptomologies. One person has gas floating pressure. The other has severe pain and cramping two very different styles of the same condition. So when somebody comes in to see me with a particular issue, I always wait to see what the feet are going to say, which is really the foundation of my work of foot assessment as opposed to foot reflexology. We're not just rubbing the reflexes based on a guidebook. We're intelligently communicating with the body through the natural reflexes of the feet, and that is what foot reading is all about. Bam! Should, glad we're recording this, because I just said that really, really well. Uh, okay, so let's see, Sarah jumps on and she says, have you had any success with ladies who are going through menopause? Uh, have you had any success with any clients that suffer with OCD? Menopause, actually the first study that was published in America for reflexology was published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology about reflexology's regulatory effect on the menstrual cycle. So that, I mean, I know that study because I've read it a billion times because that was kind of the first one. Uh, but I personally, that was also one of my earliest stories. Like I had a woman come in uh, for reflexology just for a half hour or something really quick. She kind of walked in off the street and it, she rebooked the next week and she said, my husband is paying for all of my sessions because I just started my cycle and I didn't bite his head off this week. Uh, and so she immediately noticed a dramatic effect on hormone regulation. So I see clients like that all the time. But again, that idea of not just pressing the button to fix the issue, but assessing why is this person's cycle so out of balance? Why is it causing so much pain and dysfunction when a natural process really should work independently on its own? That idea of foot reading is very, very important. Uh, OCD, same thing. I mean, any kind of compulsion or craving, because it's all connected with the nervous system, Reflexology can be very, very helpful. Um, I haven't had direct OCD work, uh, a client who comes in and literally writes kind of OCD on their health history form, but I have worked with any type of craving or habit, smoking, eating, uh, anything where the body feels compelled to do something. I mean, we're hacking the nervous system basically through the nerve endings on the feet and the other extremities. So I found great results with that. Let's see. And Marie agrees, so glad to have some support. Melanie Lewis, I agree with Sam, makes sense to me. And how I've worked over the last five years, everybody is so different. Thank you. Okay, so then Kelly has another question for me. Uh, is foot reading something all reflexologists can learn? Oh, well, no, let's talk about when did you discover you had an interest in foot reading? So again, I started off in reflexology and then I kind of hit a wall. I pursued both national certifications uh, through the American Reflexology Certification Board here in the US, which was kind of like the cap, like I couldn't go any further than that uh, in my credentialing. And so I was really kind of like at a dead end. How do I study the feet from here? You know, having achieved every certification that I could possibly get up the ranks. And so I started searching and I also had a couple clients that their issues didn't make sense. Like they came in and they had some pain in different areas 
and I would tell them about the reflex association to that and they kind of shot it down and they're like, no, that really doesn't resonate with me. I don't have issues in that area. So I started to wonder, like, what if there's something else that the feet are trying to say other than the physical reflexes? And that's when I found the work of Jing Shihan. So I talk about her in the book and I've talked about her a lot uh, on my, uh, I just did a webinar on what is foot reading and talked a lot about her and that. She's based in the UK. She wrote a book called Let's Read Our Feet. Then I also found the book Reading Toes by Imri Samoji. Uh, those two books were really seminal in terms of me getting interested in the mental emotional aspect of foot reading. And from there, it was very much like fish to water. Like I have a background in energy medicine. It all kind of made sense. And it was just trial and error from that point in terms of validating that, yes, the physical reflexes are mapped on the feet, but also the mental emotional kind of correspondences of those reflexes are mapped on the feet as well. And falling down the rabbit hole from that standpoint. Uh, and it evolved into the practice that we see today. Uh, do, do, do. Kat Ann says, since we're not supposed to treat, diagnose, or cure, what type of wording do you use when you see issues? I always find this to be a challenge as I'm a newbie. Great question, Kat, and I'm going to blow your mind because uh, I talked about this in my foot reading videos on YouTube. I do not DPT or diagnose, prescribe, or treat. Instead, I always aim to ACE or assess, coach, and educate. How do you like that? So instead of diagnosing, uh, we're assessing. Instead of prescribing, we are coaching. And instead of treating, we're educating. And that allows us to kind of mirror the, the code of ethics without breaching scope of practice. Because I'm not really interested in telling somebody that they have cancer. Sorry, that's way too much red tape. Like, don't put that responsibility on my shoulders. I'm not qualified for that. And I personally don't want to get involved in all that drama. But I can encourage you, based on what I've seen in other clients, to maybe take that mysterious lump a little bit more seriously, to maybe go see a digestive specialist, to maybe consider that there is a mental emotional aspect of your pain that could be feeding into the condition and to creating more of a consultative approach as opposed to, you know, this is sciatica or this is frozen shoulder, you know, because that's just dangerous territory, Kat, and we don't want to get mixed up in that. Um, Suzanne says, I've recently completed Jane Sheehan's course. Yes, Suzanne, love you. Uh, we actually watched Feet Change Color Texture during a reading. Yes, it's fascinating. Uh, Melanie says, love Jane Sheehan. Denise says, uh, what about foot reading in kids? Kids are amazing. Their bodies change over so fast. Actually, I'm a proud papa. Oh, just hit my microphone. Uh, I'm a proud papa. One of my reflexology certification program students just had her baby on uh, Friday. Uh, we had the book signing party for the book, uh, and it, she came to the book signing literally ready to pop. And so she jumped on the table, got worked on by our other students who were doing free reflexology as part of the event, and she uh, her water broke and she went to the hospital that morning early at like 7 o'clock, and the labor was extremely painless, very quick, uh, which I attribute to the reflexology. And so we've literally been getting daily posts since then about the status of the baby's feet and seeing kind of how things are changing. Because kids, I mean, they're fresh, they're untainted, like their bodies are so fluid and healable. And so when we see something like the feet in children, it's often things will pop up and then they'll immediately disappear. But when they're sick, they're sick. So seeing kind of where the issues are in the feet of children, but also noticing how quickly they recover, I think is fascinating. Kat says, thank you. Uh, so let me kind of go into, is foot reading something all reflexologists can learn to do? Absolutely. In fact, as reflexologists, we totally have a leg up with the foot reading concept. And especially if like me, you feel like your reflexology training was maybe subpar, Maybe you just learned a lot of techniques and reflex locations, but you didn't really learn to palpate or feel the reflexes. That's what really inspired me to kind of delve deeper into this idea of foot reading. And then when I started to have deeper conversations with my clients on the foot reading aspect and kind of understanding the mental emotional side of the equation, that opened up a huge door for me. And I don't think it would have been easy had I not already been touching their feet as a reflexologist. So I think it's a beautiful gateway into the additional practice of foot reading. And honestly, as a reflexologist, I mean, it just freaking blows your mind. Like we're taught that the body is interconnected, but to see like we're seeing in the comments, like live changing of tissue textures and feet and toe orientation, like spontaneously, it's, it's magical to tell you the truth. 
Uh, Kat says, what are different things you do to get the client to relax, especially those uh, that talk a ton and they're amped up coming in? Great question. Uh, like worst comes to work, so if the, if the client is being a chatty Cathy uh, and they won't shut up, and I feel, here's, here's the, the key part of it though, I feel like their talkativeness is interfering with the session, okay? Because some clients come in and as a reflexologist, we create a very safe and neutral space for people. We're not asking them to disrobe, we're asking them to just lean back, relax in a dimly quiet room and we're just working on the feet. We're not touching anything that may be considered private, although the feet can be considered private, yeah. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we're always giving the client that opportunity to vent when it's appropriate. So some clients come in and it's really their only chance to speak. They can't talk with their friends, they can't talk with their family. And so sometimes that talking can be therapeutic, but, but at the same time, if their jabber jaw is preventing them from relaxing, I'll literally just slap an eye pillow on and tell them, you know, now would be the time of the session to maybe dial back and breathe a little bit deeper and maybe enjoy the relaxation of it. Uh, and they kind of get the hint and they know, like they know that they talk a lot. Let's, let's stop kidding ourselves from that standpoint. So we, it's really just about understanding where is that line between therapeutic dialogue and non-therapeutic dialogue. Perfect, excellent. Uh, Denise says, I would like to do an event on foot reading. Should I wait for your online course first? I mean, if you're interested in it, go for it. Like if you have the book and you're confident and you can develop some case studies. Um, I've been doing a couple webinars on what is foot reading. Uh, for those of you that have been a part of the group you saw, I did a paid webinar with uh, generating a foot reading report, which is really unique. When you start to feel confident in foot reading, I encourage you to go for it because nobody told me to go for it. I just freaking went for it. And I think that more, more power to you. Like if you're confident in the feet, if you love the feet, if you're, if you're really in tune with the messages that are present within the tissue textures, then maybe start with like a three hour intro class, build up your confidence and go from there. But don't let the, don't let like the course prevent you from taking action. Like I'd rather you maybe teach a teaser and then sign up for the course and then teach as you're learning. Cause it's not like, boom, you're certified the end. Yeah, that's not how, that's not how learning works. So definitely just keep working with the content, but don't let the lack of resources stop you. Cause I only had two books and then I took Jane Sheehan's online course, which I mean, if we're gonna be honest, like my online course is way more extensive than her online course. Like I've put in a lot of stuff to that online course, way, way more stuff to that online course. So it's gonna be a lot more than what you're used to. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go ahead. Like the book, is where I'm drawing a lot of the online course stuff. So if you read the book, you know what I'm gonna talk about. It's just gonna be a lot more extensive. Where can I buy your book uh, on foot reading? It's available on all platforms all over the world. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, both physically as well as electronically. Um, if you're in the US, you could always order it directly from me and I can ship it to you autograph copy uh, or you can order it from the publisher. But I mean, it's on Nook, it's on Kindle, you can buy it pretty much anywhere books are sold, I guess. The one thing that I would suggest is if you buy it, like leave a review, let other people know that this is a valuable resource for you. Because when I struggled, I mean, Jane's book was barely popular and then uh, it really started to catch fire. And obviously some of you know that you've been following the work. So when, I mean, if I had like five, six reviews under Jane's book and it didn't look like I was going into the back room of Amazon to get this book that nobody was reading, you know, I think it would have been a lot more accessible to me. So if you are gonna go buy the book, make sure to leave a review and let other reflexologists know that this is the next step in their, their foot education from that standpoint. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Excellent. Okay, so can you hold up the book again so <laughs> we can see it? There you go, Harriet. Uh, and while, ooh, let, me, let me position it for the camera. There we go. And while I position it from, for the camera, let's talk a little bit about uh, the next question. So Kelly says, what advice would you offer a reflexologist who wanted to add foot reading into their business? There are a couple different ways that you can do that. So just learning the material and interjecting it when you have conversations with your clients. So the way that I started with foot reading is I, I studied very vigorously and I started to really kind of test and validate the information with friends and family. And then what I did was I started to, at the end of the session, kind of be a little bit more engaged with giving them pointed feedback. So I would say, 
hey, you know, during the session, I noticed that there was a lot of tension around the right hip reflex. Now, physically, that could mean that the right hip is tight, or it could mean that you're still struggling with past family and relationship stress. And I'd lead the conversation at that. If they took it and they didn't want to speak any more about it, then I would let them just kind of absorb that information. But most of the time, the clients were like, wait, wait, what did you just say? And it really piqued their interest that I was able to both assess physically and mentally and emotionally what was still happening in their nervous system and in their body, just through looking at the feet and through working on the feet. So those little tidbits at the end, maybe even ending the session a couple minutes early just to have an active feedback dialogue is kind of how I started. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And Claire says, do fungal infections indicate anything other than there is just an infection? Oh, actually, hold that thought. Uh, what advice would you offer a reflexologist who wanted to add foot reading to their business? I think that's pretty much about it, just to kind of wrap that up, just those last couple minutes of the session to get pointed dialogue with the client and really open up the foot reading discussion. Anyway, uh, doo -doo -doo. Claire says, Fungal infections, do they indicate anything other than just an infection? Yes, absolutely yes. It just depends on where the infection is taking place. When people say infections, most of the time they mean toenail fungus. And let me be the first, if you have not heard this already, that there are many different kinds of toenail fungus. And most of the time when people say toenail fungus, it's not real fungus. It's callusing. It's a buildup of thick keratin tissue within the nail not a true fungal infection. So it depends on if it's a real fungal infection, if it's just a patch of the irritation and dryness and where exactly it's located. But I talk about that all in the book. Basically, you can think of it as an infection in the tissue, means a physical infection in that area of the body, but also from a mental emotional standpoint represents kind of a mental emotional infection of thoughts and feelings in that area of their life. We go very, very detailed into the book as far as the right side or the right foot being past influences versus the left foot being present influences and understanding from that sideways perspective as well. And just having that deeper conversation, even if you don't really understand foot reading principles, if you see a client consistently and then all of a sudden their foot breaks out into an infection, you get the feeling that something's up. You know that something's happening. You just can't really put a word to it. So even if you just kind of bring that purposefulness, bring that awareness and say, did something happen? Is, is there something else that's going on? You can just invite that dialogue and create that essence of foot reading without knowing the specifics. Okay. Have you studied Chris Dormer's foot reading book also? No, Emory, I haven't. If you wanted to direct message me and give me that link, I would be more than happy to look at it. I'm still learning. I'm still getting resources. Like, I learn stuff every day. Uh, probably one of the most crucial turning points for me recently was when I started posting on social media. Um, I started getting pictures coming in from all over the world, people who were sending me their feet, people who were really kind of curious about this idea of foot reading, but also some clients like asking me for help, like genuinely concerned about health and wellness problems. And did I see what was happening in the feet? And so I started posting a lot of those cases on social media, most notably my YouTube channel, but also on Instagram, and that was really part of my learning process. And so I'm constantly, constantly getting new feedback and new resources and honing my skills that way. Kelly says, that's so true with one of my clients. They have a fungal nail on the big toe, third, fourth on the right foot. They've gone through so much emotionally. Exactly, Kelly, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Fun thing, uh, just to kind of give you a story that's not in the book, so giving you some exclusive content. Uh, I have a client that comes in to see me. They've been coming to see me for a while now, and they have a genuine toenail fungus. But what's interesting is that the fungus will either expand or recede based on their level of mental stress. They suffer from chronic mental anxiety and depression. And what happens is, based on their attitude, I'll be able to tell how much the fungus is actually present during the session. But likewise, if, I, if they're being really somber and I notice that the infection has actually taken a turn for the worse and the, the black kind of tendrils of the fungus have started to spread, I know that we're going to have a very deep discussion during the session and it's going to be a little bit more of using those therapeutic coaching tools during the work as opposed to the manual therapy itself. Okay. Perfect. Excellent, Claire. I will definitely look up that book. Uh, do, do, do. 
And then what inspired you to establish the Foot Whisperer Reflexology Institute? This is fun. So this is a fun story. When I started getting really good at foot reading, it was very much like divine intervention. So I had a couple clients that I was seeing for a very long time, years, and they came in and they didn't know each other. They were in very different professions. They came at very different times just during the week, but they were consistent. And they both started calling me the foot whisperer within the same week. And that was, that was really odd to me because they were very different individuals. One of them was very medically oriented, very scientific, and the other one was kind of very hippie-ish and, and very new agey. But they both came up with the same term based on the book, the, Hor the Horse Whisperer at the time. This was kind of at the time that the dog whisperer was just starting to get popular. And it, so we were, me and my business partner were chatting around the pool one day and we started, no, we started talking about the business. And I said, so some of my clients have started calling me the foot whisperer. And he immediately turns to me and he's like, that's it. That's the name. That's the new brand. And so we rebranded into the Foot Whisperer Reflexology Institute in 2014. And the joke literally became the brand. And that was how the Foot Whisperer Reflexology Institute was born, it was just from my clients authentically kind of giving me the name that was kind of developing as I started to discover foot reading and started to discover kind of how my practice was evolving from an assessment standpoint. And that was that was really fun to, to kind of go through that process. Okay, thanks Kelly, glad you liked that story. Uh, another question from Kelly, as well as being a successful reflexologist, foot reader and teacher, you recently had your book, Foot Reading, a reflexology primer on foot assessment published. Please share what love reflexology members can expect from this exciting title. So the book is based off of my work that I've been developing kind of under wraps uh, for the past year and a half to two years. And this is kind of back when I first started to discover Jane's work and Imri's work and started to put it to the test, but then also combining it with the International Institute's work and discovering the physical and mental emotional meaning of the foot reflexes. I started to teach that way in my live reflexology certification program here at the Institute in Tampa, Florida in the US. So I was kind of teasing this content with my students and I was kind of putting out the content uh, gradually in a drip format, talking about the elements, talking about foot reading, talking about how to do a foot reading consultation, talking about how to create a foot reading soap note, how to generate a foot reading report. And they were loving it. Like they were just gobbling it up. And they, I had told them that the book was kind of in the works and they were really supportive of that. And they were very patient. Uh, and they were very excited when the book was finally launched. But this has been content that I've been working on for a while. So when I actually sat down to fully write it, it just happened. Like it only took me about four months to actually bang it out. And then magically, you know, magically the uh, publishing process that was supposed to take six months only took two because we were just so on the ball with that. Uh, so things that you can expect from the book are really things that are practical to the everyday reflexologists because it's like, it's foot reading from a reflexology perspective. So we talk about the significance of horizontal zones. We talk about this idea of vertical zones, not necessarily like William Fitzgerald vertical zones, but what Jane calls vertical zones of influence and how they are both tied to physical influencing structures and mental emotional influencing structures that cause the markers to manifest in very specific areas on the feet. So we talk about how to map from physical and a mental emotional perspective. We talk about walking patterns. We talk about how to decode the different markers in terms of elemental language. So are you seeing air markers like patches of dryness, lining, cracks in the tissue, hypermobility? Are you seeing earth markers like rigidity, callusing, overgrowth of bones, warts? Are you seeing fire markers like patches of heat? redness, kind of that infective athlete's foot tendency, um, but also pain and spasm? Or are you seeing water markers like fluid, hypersensitivity, uh, superficial veins, all of those things, decoding the markers based on elemental theory. And then finally, towards the end of the book, we talk about how to coach people through assessing the feet and how to really sit down with a foot reading report, a foot reading consultation, and even do remote sessions via Skype. And then we kind of blow out the back of the book by exploring how we take the foot map and apply it to the hands, face, and ears to give you possibilities to use foot reading in a new and exciting way that maybe you never thought before. So 
just some preview of the book. And also, like, if you follow me on Facebook, if you follow me on Instagram or YouTube, you know the content because I've been talking about it for such a long time. So if you want free resources to just start learning foot reading, go there. Like, find the free stuff first and then, you know, buy the book if you feel so inclined. But just to play with re with uh, this foot reading concept, it's free of charge if you just know how to look and how to follow me on, on social media. Uh, do, do, do. Denise says, we would love to have you. I would love to go to the UK. Uh, Don says, just ordered your book from Amazon UK. Really enjoying this. Thanks, Don. I appreciate the support. Are you talking meridians, says Denise. Nope, I am not talking meridians. Um, I have studied traditional Chinese medicine, and I didn't study it formally like acupuncture school study it, but I, I know enough to be dangerous would be the best way to say it. However, we are not discussing meridians in the foot reading work. We are not talking traditional five element theory as well. Uh, so what we're talking about are the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, very kind of linear aspect of the elements, not coded in traditional Chinese medicine philosophy. I know that some schools of reflexology tout reflexology as a Eastern modality and focus more on the meridian points and the subos that are located within the feet, very much like Lillian Morton's work. Love Lillian. She's amazing. She actually taught some of the classes that I was in over at the International Institute. But I'm staying away from that content because I personally find it to be confusing when I'm talking with clients that have no background in body work whatsoever. So the foot reading book and the intention of the book is for practitioners, but it's also for the lay people. Like somebody should be able to pick up the book and to say, I have plantar fasciitis. I have this weird toe that's clawed down. I have this patch of dryness. What does that mean? And they should be able to decode the meaning just by looking at the content in this book. And that's the goal, not to bog them down with complicated theory or to bog you down as the practitioner with complicated theory. And TCM just goes really, really deep into that space. So I wanted to keep it more simple and leave that content out, although it is totally pra practically applicable. So not bashing it, just this is separate work from that theory. Um, Sarah says, I have a few clients with hypermobility. What's the meaning behind this? So hypermobility in the feet is related to hypermobility in the body. So when we think of where the bones are kind of moving and those lax ligaments are letting them move maybe past the normal range of motion, that would be what we would call an air marker, Sarah. Uh, and that air marker indicates that the area does not have enough stability or strength or structure in order to hold its proper alignment. So we would coach people with hypermobility and certain reflexes like if the ankle is really hypermobile, if you're doing the relaxation techniques and the ankle is just flopping all over the place and it's not holding its proper shape and maybe leading to joint impingement or nerve impingement, we would coach them to kind of bulk up on their earth or their solid structure through something like a strength training, something like an Iyengar yoga that would build up the integrity of some of those ligaments, something like that. Uh, Claire says, love your YouTube foot reading sessions. Thanks so much. We've got uh, some new ones coming up. And then Denise says, great. It confuses me also. Perfect. Lorianne just jumped on. I'd be interested on your thoughts about plantar fasciitis. I have five clients suffering with it at the moment. Okay, Lorianne, we're going to blow your mind for two seconds. So plantar fasciitis, for those of you that don't know, is pain in the heel. Uh, which manifests as a very sharp stabbing sensation in most people, normally worse first thing in the morning when they first put their feet down on the floor, kind of when the body is cold would be the best way to say it. Plantar fasciitis, though, if it's that pain directly in the heel area, the heel represents the lower body reflexes and reflexology. So people with plantar fasciitis, whatever side it's occurring on, very significant, would be an indicator of sciatica. So somebody who has plantar fasciitis might be ignoring the fact that their sciatic nerve has a little bit too much pressure or tension around it, or maybe they have a chronic knee issue that they've been stuffing and haven't been addressing physically. So the plantar fasciitis is just a reminder that the lower body is in pain, but maybe they're not listening as much. From a mental emotional standpoint, what's also very interesting is that kind of from an internal perspective, the heel represents horizontal zone five, which is the internal significance of somebody's sense of security and how they're moving forward. So I find that people who suffer from chronic plantar fasciitis are often in the middle of a divorce, a very traumatic event, like a death in the family, or they're going through major transition, like physically moving a home or uh, maybe a financial crisis. 
things where their internal sense of security and how they're moving forward has been drastically compromised. And the foot is just echoing through the mental emotional significance of the zones. So I hope that that answers your question, Sarah. Uh, do, 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 or Lorianne, rather. That's, uh, that's a question from Lorianne. Uh, let me know what you think about that, Lorian, and we'll move on to the next question from Kelly. Uh, when you have a day off from work, how do you like to relax and unwind? I am a total bookworm, um, and I'm huge on self-development. So when I am relaxing, I'm normally reading a book on self-development. Uh, I'm also really big into philosophy and world religion. So normally I'll hang out in metaphysical shops and kind of pick up a book here and there and just start reading about Kind of the latest theory about holistic interconnectedness or maybe quantum physics or spiritual theory like i'm really addicted to the abraham hicks works and um let's see what would be some other ones uh the the secret series is really fun i also am reading let's see thinking to my kindle list i'm right now reading a fascinating but very heady book called the sacred canopy which is more of a college level book on integrative world religions and the theosophy behind it so like it wide range, but I'm a total nerd and that's normally how I like to spend my time is nose in a book. Uh, but I also do a lot of yoga, I do a lot of meditation, um, I do a lot of hippie stuff from that standpoint. So if I'm not in a yoga class or if I'm not reading a book, then I'm pretty much just vegged out on the couch or working on my next online course because I'm definitely uh, a workaholic from that standpoint. I really enjoy creating content, I really enjoy talking about what I do because I love it. So it's not really work for me. And so it's it's a lot harder for me to turn it off, but it's not really a tax on me as well because it's it's just amazing and I never get enough of it. Uh, what are you reading at the moment? I just said that, great, we're, we're on the same page, Kelly. I'm loving this. Uh, Don says, I've had very bad plantar fasciitis on the left heel. You just summed it up for me. Awesome, Don. I've had enough clients with plantar fasciitis that they tell me the exact same thing. Uh, that's really where plantar fasciitis gets super fun. It's because it kind of comes on in the middle of the night with no rhyme or reason. It's all due to that internal stress. And then it will mysteriously leave like it never happened. And it's always when that kind of life major stressor comes to a close. Excellent. Uh, do you treat your own feet, Claire says? Uh, no, that's why I have students, right? So I own a reflexology institute. I make my students work on me. Like that's that's one of the perks of being a reflexology instructor. I mean, it like when worse comes to worse, if my body is trying to speak to me in a very aggressive way through a pain pattern, um, after I've exhausted kind of my, my normal preventative maintenance, I will go to my reflexes. And just like when I'm watching TV or something, just kind of manipulate the reflexes just to let the know, let my body know that I hear it and that I understand kind of that it's asking me to slow down and be a little bit more in tune. Uh, but I, uh, man, it feels so much better when somebody does it to you instead of you doing it to yourself. And I'm sure that we all can, can agree on that. Uh, Claire's cracking up, I absolutely love it. Uh, then one of the last questions that Kelly uh, jumped on with was when you, uh, what does your business have planned for 2018 and do you have any plans to visit the UK? Uh, 2018, really big, we're rolling out our foot reading online course uh, certification. So it'll be either a 12 month course or a 12 week course if you wanted to enroll in the boot camp kind of condensed version, but it's the same course, but you will get a certificate of completion after that saying you are a certified foot reading practitioner. So that'll be really fun. Really excited to launch that. If you stick to with me on social media and follow in the groups and stuff, I'll make a big stink about that. That's gonna be launched in January timeframe. Uh, so you'll definitely hear about that. I personally would love to come to the UK I get asked to come like all over the world or to teach and speak and do stuff like this. I find online is really, really helpful though. Like if you have other podcasts or other groups that you want me to live stream in like this, I love doing this kind of stuff. Like I could do it all day. So actually physically being present though, takes a lot more time, it takes a lot more energy, it takes a lot more finances for me to kind of skip over the pond. So if you know an establishment or maybe an institute that wants to house me, bring me in as a speaker, and it makes financial sense for them. I would love to do that. I've never been to the UK. I'm totally down with it. Uh, let's make it happen. So somebody put me in touch with somebody else and we'll, we'll get it done. Uh, can't wait for the course. Excellent. Uh, Emery just jumped on. What are your thoughts on arthritis and how do you find it responds well to reflexology? Responds really well to reflexology. But again, part of that assessment side of the foot reading aspect, we're trying to figure out why the reflexologist is, or why the, the reflexologist, why the arthritis is there in the first place. So really trying to pinpoint 
Like if somebody has chronic arthritis, is it coming from their diet? Is it coming from a specific joint impingement that is maybe referring to other areas creating that, that arthritic condition? Like what is the underlying linchpin of that condition as opposed to just let's press a button and make the arthritis go away, which helps nobody uh, from that standpoint. Uh, do, 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 do you have courses online now and how much? I'm in Ireland, I would love to do it. I do have courses online right now. You can find the free stuff online though, so check out the YouTube channel for all my routines and stuff. I'm in the process of revamping my physical reflexology courses. So if you don't wanna spend extra money, don't buy those courses from me yet. I know an online course creator that's saying don't buy the courses. Uh, because I, after I complete the foot reading course, I'm gonna be re-rolling out the hands-on course into kind of an apprenticeship style, just like the foot reading is just taking me a lot of time. I'm also writing another book. Like I've got a lot on my plate, but I will get it done. Um, uh, Kelly says, will you come back and speak next year? Of course, I love this group. There's so much love happening in this group right now. I absolutely love it. Harriet says, can you identify the sex of an unborn baby? I've heard many different theories. Harriet, I mean, to tell you the truth, it's a 50-50 shot. I mean, I've never been able to do that. I always go by intuitive feel with that, but at the same time, reflexology shouldn't be used for that. It's not really, it's a party trick at that point. And that's not what I'm what I'm kind of here for. Not to not to burst your bubble, but that's, that's kind of how I feel about that, uncensored. Sharon uh, says, what can you tell me about uh, seronegative arthritis in left foot? Not really sure what you mean by that. I've never heard of seronegative arthritis. So if you could explain that to me a little bit more. But the left foot represents the left side of the body in the present moment of stress. So I'd say that whatever kind of arthritis is happening in the left foot, if it's just in the left foot, then it's definitely related to an increase in your stress level. So define that for me and we'll talk a little bit about more about that. But before we go into any other questions, I wanted to just jump into, I'm gonna pull up the actual email from Kelly just so that I make sure that I get the name right. Um, Christy Gordon was the winner of the foot reading contest and I got her feet. Kelly, if you wanted to post those in the group now, I'll kind of give my impromptu reading. I've jotted some notes down. Kelly kindly let me look at them beforehand so I didn't have to do it on the fly so I could focus just on the assessment aspect. Um, so if you wanted to post those pictures in the group, I'll be able to give you my reading in this uh, webinar that you can always kind of go back and look at. So if you look at the pictures, the first thing that you're gonna notice on the medial lateral view of those two pictures of Christie's foot is you're gonna see waves. So whenever you see waves in the heel, waves in general mean instability as well as weakness. And that's a big indicator for me. It's what we would term an air marker. And those waves in the heel give me the feeling that Christie specifically has a lot of lower body trembling and instability that needs to be taken care of. Uh, also, from an internal standpoint, waves in horizontal zone five, the heel area, represent kind of like an unstable ground, an unstable footing. Her sense of security is a little bit compromised. And I'll talk a little bit more on how to reverse that kind of towards the end of the discussion. Uh, in the dorsal view of Christie's feet, you can see that she has the specialist's toe. And for some of you who have studied Jane Sheehan's work, you're really gonna kind of resonate with this, but you'll see that the toe is more narrow, but it's also deeper, as opposed to a toe that toenail that's wider and shorter. When we see the narrow and depth toe, that represents that Christie specifically is a specialist. She knows a lot about a few things and she's normally very mentally ingrained in her work. She's gone through a lot of studying and a lot of internal kind of bulking up of her specialty throughout her life. Her mind is very deep on the, on the subjects that she chooses to study, as opposed to somebody with that wider, shorter nail, which mentally, I mean, they're kind of jack of all trades. They kind of study a little bit here, a little bit there, not really focusing on one area in particular. They're great at parties. They're always gonna be the one that's gonna be great at Jeopardies. Jeopardy because they, they have like fun facts that they can rattle off the top of their head versus unless you're talking about like anesthesia to an anesthesiologist, like they're not interested, that would be the specialist toe. Also on that dorsal view, you can see that the big toe tissue has kind of pulled over on the side. So on that dorsal view, in addition to that nail that's uh, thinner and then also deeper, you can see that the big toe pad has kind of on the side, that skin is starting to pull out. And that indicates that Christy has a lot on her mind always. So she's constantly, 
constantly dealing with that excessive mental energy. Also prone to sinus issues and sinus stagnation if we wanted to think physical reflexes. And then last but not least, tension in the pelvic flexors and chest area. So on the dorsal view, you can see right in what would be the fallopian tube reflexes, that dorsal ankle kind of where the, uh, the foot meets the, the shin bone, you can see that tendon is really popped and pronounced. And that would represent those really deep pelvic flexors and so she might be dealing with some psoas issues or some low back impingement that is from kind of sitting too long. Again, that idea of the specialist, somebody who's working in front of a computer, long hours, studying, 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 you know, crunching numbers, crunching numbers, and not really taking that break. Those pelvic flexors are kind of locked, giving that idea of pelvic tension. But also, she tried to outsmart me. She tried to erase the evidence. There's some callousing in the ball of her feet that she tried to erase and kind of buff off uh, pre-picture. Uh, but that callousing, that residual callousing, lets us know that she has a lot of tension in the chest area as well. So overall, kind of this reading of Christie's feet, uh, we have somebody who's built up and lives very much in their head and heart space somebody who's very mentally active, somebody who's very emotionally uh, involved. But then if we look at the contrast with the lower centers of the foot around the heel, there's not as much physical stability there. So internally, that sense of security, maybe issues revolving around finances, or maybe not really knowing where the next paycheck is gonna come from is very much in the nervous system. Physically though, there's a lot of tension around the head space, there's a lot of tension around the heart space, but a lot of weakness in the lower body. So if there was any information that I could really hone in on with Christy as far as preventative maintenance go, it would be to stretch out the neck, stretch out the chest, lung, shoulder area, really make sure that area doesn't lock down. Again, that kyphotic structure of punching in front of a computer all day like you're prone to do, really free that space up. But then in contrast, tone the lower body. Don't let the lower body just be part of your meat suit. Really make sure that you are strength training, that you're building up the musculature in the legs and knees so that you don't develop kind of weakness prone sciatica, bum knees, or you know something like plantar fasciitis in the future. So those are just some quick notes that I wanted to jot down about Christy's feet. If you have foot pictures that you wanted to send to me, you could always send them to me at sam at footwhisperer.com or through the Foot Whisperer Reflexology Institute page. Now that that foot reading's done, let me kind of jump on to some of the other questions that I've got. Uh, do, do, do. Always doesn't show up. Sorry, Sharon, still don't understand what you're trying to say, so definitely shoot me a private message. Okay, I'll do that. I'll be live on the wall. Thanks so much, Kelly, for posting that. Uh, do, do, do. And then images are posted on the main discussion board as I'm not able to post them in this comment box. So definitely look at those. Uh, let me know what you think about that assessment. If you have any other questions, we've got a couple of minutes left, feel free to post them. But I'm just so appreciative of Kelly asking me to come on here and talk about foot reading. Again, as a reflexologist who started in this field a while back, not really dis expecting to discover what I discovered. It's been such a fascinating journey. And I think if there was one thing to really leave you with it's this idea that the feet are 10 times more powerful than you even can imagine they are. I'm constantly impressed with how powerful the feet are, as well as the other extremities, but definitely kind of from a from starting from a foot standpoint, like working on the feet, the feet always have a special place to me. Um, but if you're drawn towards the hands, face, and ears, that's great too. Uh, but the feet definitely part of my, my personal repertoire. Uh, they are just such beautiful structures and I'm so blessed to work with them on a daily basis. Melanie jumped on, uh, so enjoyed this live link. Love Sam's passion, enthusiasm, brilliant speaker. Thank you so much. Jackie said, what can you tell me about treatment for lupus? Harriet said, brilliant, thank you. So Jackie, uh, lupus is a very interesting condition. All autoimmune conditions are very interesting uh, because they affect everybody differently. Again, back to what we were saying before, reflexology is not press button fix issue. So although there are traditional reflexes that you might press for something like a lupus or a fibromyalgia, when somebody comes into the institute, when they write down a symptom or a diagnosed disease, I'm blank slating with them. I'm not putting them in a box. So I'm working with what the feet are telling me about where their body is breaking down. Sometimes it's systemic infection. It's an immune response, like a true immune issue. Other times it's just diet and like chronic inflammation. 
Sometimes it's just the fact that they're not moving and that their body becomes stagnant. Sometimes it's a specific stressor that's triggering the lupus and there's a timeline associated with it. It varies from person to person. So don't put somebody in the symptom box and really make sure that you're communicating with them one-on-one -on -one and that you're really using the feet as a window into their whole person. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody really enjoyed it. I'm so glad. So we're at four o'clock on the dot. I guess we'll start to wrap up right now, going a little bit over, but please don't let the conversation stop here. You know, we're gonna end this live stream. I would love to be back, Kelly, but if you have additional questions, please feel free to, to reach out to me either via email at sam at footwhisperer.com, through the Institute's Facebook page, through our online foot reading and reflexology group. I am here for you. If you need a mentor, if you need somebody to bounce questions off of, like I am here to help you get better at what you do for a living because it's just such fascinating work. Thank you so much for giving me uh, all of your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So much love. Uh, and I will end it here, but it's been such a pleasure. And again, please feel free to reach out and we'll continue this conversation one-on-one. -on -one. But for now, ciao, and I will see y'all later. Mwah.